Okay, Jason, well, thanks for having me back out yeah. in LA. And, uh, yeah. It's good to be back out here. Um, so I think last time I was here, it was springtime, and all the spring ephemerals were going. Uh, the prairie hadn't really started growing yet. Uh, there's still the burn marks from this side. Yep. And uh, So why don't you just tell us how the season's been going? Sure. Uh, so that was April, I think, when you were out here. And there was uh, at least one rainfall in April, and then since then, it's been pretty much dry. Right. So, so today's the exception, where it yeah. rained a little bit. And, um, <laughs> you're, you're a lucky uh, lucky person, I guess, for yeah, rain. Yeah, rain It's been, uh, with the dryness, you, you really have to treat it a little bit differently. Um, so last year, when it was raining quite often, what we would do is, when we were, whenever we were doing any sort of um, cutting, mm -hmm. we would be able to cut the, the trees and burn the slash piles right there. You yeah. can't do that when it's exceptionally dry. And so we had to modify what we were actually working on. We did a lot more mowing this year. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of like how it impacts the, the prairie, the savannah, the trees, a drought like that wasn't significant enough really to put a damper on this, this, type of, um, this type of habitat, I guess. How much drier do you think it would have to be before the native prairie plants would really start getting stressed and potentially dying off? I think it's probably, the, the, the tap roots of these things really are deep, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to have some ground um, water that you're, you're going to be able to get as a prairie plant. Right. Um, I think the heat is probably going to be the bigger thing. So okay. if it's a yeah. lot hotter, mm -hmm. my guess is it would stress them a lot more just because they have access to water through the deep roots. Right. But if it's just really, really hot, really, really dry, you also then have a lot of potential for summer fire, which is okay. something that sure. does stress the plants. Mm -hmm. um, or cancer plants because then uh, they, they burn down and can't put seed out. So. Right. Do you think it stresses the non-natives more than the natives? Oh, or? definitely, because they're just not adapted to that the, uh, the heat, the temperature, um, the lack of water. They don't have the deep tap roots often. Right. So, yeah, the, the non-natives, especially the annuals, mm -hmm. would definitely be get back for yeah. the dry season. Okay, interesting. So, and what sort of plants have you seen as the season progresses? actually learned a little bit about why we're seeing various things which has been really cool um, just been doing a lot of reading on you know what other people are seeing um, we saw a lot of mint species out here we saw obviously now all the yellow is pretty much solidago all the white at this point is solidago is, goldenrod are those different? it is okay. same thing there's a couple different species mm. uh, of solidago goldenrods right. um, the white stuff is is white snake root um, there's a lot of other yeah. stuff that you really can't see because it's lower down there are some asters out here. We have some sunflowers on the far side of the property. And are those uh, like native thistles, the smaller? Some of them shape? are. You mean these here? Yeah, yeah. No, this is ironweed. Okay. So I'll grab this one. This is a native. It's like the nice purple. Yeah, okay. the nice big purple. And there's a couple different species of ironweed out here. This is one that I'm actually gathering some seed from. Okay. Um, so it's, it's another good one. We do have some native thistle out here, field thistles. At first, I was a little bit concerned right. because of the number. I wasn't right. sure if they were native or not. Mm -hmm. um, native thistle have that nice silvery underneath the leaf, and so it's pretty easy to tell which ones are which. But and so this is kind of a random question, but do you subscribe to the Friends of Hickory Hill Facebook page? I do. Because I know they just had a thing on the white snake root and the history with the cattle. Yeah. Exactly, yep, yep. So they, they have a lot of interesting stuff on there. And so that's one of the reasons you're seeing, uh, what I mentioned before, why you're seeing what you're seeing out here. Mm -hmm. This was grazed for quite a while, right. this, this whole piece of property. And what I learned was that cattle just don't like certain plants. Among okay. them, mint species, mm -hmm. which this thing is full of mint, mm -hmm. and then the white snake root, obviously. And then there are a couple other, like the thistle, where they just don't eat them. Mm -hmm. And so when you have grazed properties, you just have this you know, huge number of those species right. because they avoided them for so long. Right, so the seed bed gets established. Exactly. And, so I'm wondering, your current strategy is more focused on brush removal and burning when applicable. Um, do you think that'll cause sort of an inverse problem where the species that are most adapted to being burned seasonally will take over? Or? That's the hope actually. Okay. And so the idea is that most of the native species, the ones mm. that we want, the native grasses, most of the native forbs, they are adapted to that mm. fire ecology. Mm. And so the idea is that by burning so much, you right. are able to bring them back and then mm. you give them a toehold. And then right. once you get that, that burn cycle going, mm. um, most of the invasives should not be able to compete anymore. Right. Okay. So what's your plan coming up for, for this fall? This fall is going to be a little bit different than, than last year. Um, I've been working a little bit more on pushing back some of the trees along the fence rows. Most of the Osage orange and... Yeah, yeah, that area. And then also in here, I cut a bunch out. And even some areas where they're great native species. You have hickory, you have walnut. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is that they're they're crowding out some oak, and mm -hmm. so what I've been doing is going down all of the fence rows mm -hmm. and actually identifying all uh, any of the oak species that are in there, any of the shrub species that mm -hmm. I want to keep, and then that way I can go and clear around those to start with daylight those they call okay. it, 
and then I can decide if I want to cut back in some of the more. So right. next, uh, this winter is mostly going to be about tree removal. Okay, and I know oaks do better pr uh, pruning and whatnot in the winter time. Do you focus at all with uh, like pruning lower branches, or do you try to leave as much as possible? No, uh, we don't touch the oaks. Um, if there is a large limb that has come down that we'd be afraid of catching on fire when we okay. go burn, we might remove it. Right. But for the most part, you want to leave the the lower limbs on oaks mm -hmm. as, as as fresh as possible. Like some of the really huge ones you have. Yeah, I'll show a picture with the long like 20, 30 feet. Yeah, uh, 50 feet. 50 feet. Yeah, yeah they're massive. And yeah. uh, and the problem is that when you have those trees growing up underneath the oaks, right. you'll see those lower limbs dying off because right. they don't get any of that sunlight. Right. And so the tree puts all the energy in towards trying to like get above right. all that shade. Yeah. So when you have those dying, you know, those dead lower limbs, mm -hmm. you can tell that it used to be an open growth situation, mm -hmm. but then at some point in time it closed in, you got a lot right. of shade. So do you put much stock in sort of the like classical notion of apex uh, ecology, sort of like the oaks get succeeded by, I think, maples and whatnot. Yeah, eventually they will be. So it goes, I'm not sure the, like, the whole series, but it goes something like, you know, poplars and conifers, yeah. then you go to oaks, then mm -hmm. you go to the maples and whatever. Um, I, I, that definitely happens, right? We know that happens, and mm -hmm. there's like all this evidence that shows that post-glacial, like mm -hmm. that's what was happening all okay. across the United States, or the areas that had the glaciers. Right. The problem is that it shouldn't be happening so fast here, okay. and the right. reason that it's happening so fast is that we're, we have removed fire. Right. And so like maples aren't going to do well in an area like this that gets right. a lot of fire. Mm -hmm. People come in, and then they, they put out all the fires, they remove right. those fires, right. And so now the maples can come up and they right. just dominate everything. Okay. And so stuff that should be happening over thousands and tens of thousands yeah. of years gets compressed down to where it's happening over a hundred years. Right. Simply because yeah. you removed one of the most important ca characteristics of the landscape mm -hmm. is the fire. Interesting. So um, I want to backtrack one uh, step to the dryness we had all season. Because yeah. I was curious about your shallow cattle ponds. If they actually dried up. Completely. Completely dried up. Yeah. yeah. They actually dried up about a month ago. Um, the, sh mo the smaller, more shallow one, probably about two months ago. So what do you think the turtles do? It's a great question. That's a whole yeah. coffee field question of where yeah. the ducks go in the winter, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the turtles go to wherever the moisture is. Okay. And so they will migrate. I think some turtles actually will burrow and try mm. to like ride it out. But these ponds are completely dry. Okay. Um, eight inch cracks, soil. Like right, just right. Down to it nothing. It's pretty clay in the yeah. ponds itself. And so to yeah. the north of us, actually, um, there's a stream and there's some like shallower uh, ponds that are down closer to the water table okay. so i think that those still have water okay so my guess is that most of the turtles migrated and have you guys thought more about projects in the future like are you, have you decided if you're going to dredge them out a little bit i would love to uh, it's one of those things where like i would love to have some equipment to be able to right. really do that it's something you could do by hand right. uh, it's a lot of work obviously and we've been really focusing on more of the trees right right those ponds weren't here naturally right and so they aren't a primary focus by any means but um it's something i would actually like to dig down a little bit more so that they, they have yeah. a little bit more water to right. stay in for the droughts. And then I might do something where we could actually connect the two mm -hmm. or you know build one larger one, something like right. that. And I'd also like put the floating islands. I think I talked the last time about maybe right, floating right. islands. Have not done that. Um, it just got to be one of those things where I couldn't really you know justify the yeah. time expense of doing it. So what we're actually gonna do is get some logs and drag mm -hmm. some logs in there okay. when they're dry. Now, so was this part of Iowa, you know, most of Iowa historically was riparian wetland or uh, like seasonal wetland. Um, was this part of Iowa wetland no. at all? No, okay. this was more um, prairie, timber, and mm. some of the savannah. Okay. And so what's yeah. really interesting is when you're this far south in Iowa, it's mm. basically, the, the geography is basically northern Missouri. Right. And so yeah. there's just like the southern tier of the Iowa uh, counties. Mm. Um, if you take a look at the maps of what you know used to be here, it's, right. it's pretty much more like Missouri than it is like right. Iowa. Right, much hillier. Um, is the soil, it's more clay than loam? Uh, it depends on where you are. It's okay. very variable down here. Okay. Um, um, uh, actually, on our property, on the very western side, mm -hmm. it's much sandier. Okay. And over here, it's much loamier. And so, even you know, half a mile distance, you might have completely different soils. Do you have any and, idea why that would be? Or no. Just, okay. I mean, yeah. that's one thing I'm not that big yeah. into is, is soils. I have friends that are, um, and they know a lot more about the, the geology of it with the mm -hmm. soil. Uh, I, what I do know is that we see definitely different species mm -hmm. over there, and yeah. it's it's predominantly because the soil it's getting the same amount of rain, right? Right, right. Same watershed, right? But the soils are that much different, right? And so we see completely different species over on the far side yeah. as opposed to here. And this is the whole thing, forty acres, right? Or forty right, acres, or, yeah. half a mile. It's exactly half a mile yeah. wide, right. and about 0.15 miles deep. 
and so it's yeah. a very long, um, long property. Right. And so, yeah, it, I wasn't expecting to see the Did diversity yeah. that I do, but it's really interesting. And actually, the, the portion I thought was probably the most degraded, mm -hmm. we're finding the best species in. And best is in most unique? Uh, yeah, what, what we call most conservative. Okay. So, like, the species that um, are very difficult to get going, mm. they aren't, like, the goldenrods or, like, the... Um, you know, different species that come up even in like vacant lots, mm -hmm. so milkweed, stuff like that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. This stuff is bergamot. pretty common. Yeah, bergamot's a great what example. Is, this is yeah. Queen Anne's lace. This is an invasive. Yeah. Okay. And so like it's it's one of those ones where I'm not that concerned about, but you okay. see a decent amount of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, there's stuff like that, that it is it is growing over there and yeah. there are invasives, but then you also have, like I mentioned the orchids, we have yeah. naughty lady tresses over there. Okay. Um, we have the green milkweed that yeah. I mentioned before. It's really right, right. Rare. So I, I saw some pictures because you post on Facebook, the green milkweed and there was a couple other kinds of milkweed. Yeah. Um, so I know most people know the common milkweed and maybe the showy milkweed. Yep. Um, but what are some other ones you've seen this year? There's one called purple milkweed that's um, relatively uncommon mm -hmm. and I can't remember they there's you know great literature in Iowa about what species are in what counties mm. and that one I think is in around maybe 20 counties in Iowa probably southern tier uh, it's yeah. kind of it's a little bit all over the place interestingly so, so does a that lot suggest to you people bringing it there or just fragmented habitats so. it might be people haven't found it yet okay. in very areas in, in some areas mm. also the most habitat is, is you know pretty degraded right. and so there may have been in a lot more counties in the past mm. and it's just in little pockets now that right. haven't been found and so there's the the purple milkweed the the tall green milkweed is interesting because it has a very different leaf pattern very slender right very slender yeah, yeah very kind of pokey leaves um and they all have the characteristic you know milkweed pods mm. with the, the the plumes of the seeds um but all of the seeds themselves look very different okay and so like some are much larger and right. lighter some are you know smaller and darker brown right. and, and so you mentioned that you've been taking the green milkweed specifically in those seed pods and trying to propagate it uh, at, your, at your house in yep. Iowa City. So can you talk more about your logic behind that? Well, what I want to do is to try to get some uh, small uh, specimens, basically, that I can transplant to other areas. Mm -hmm. And so I want to try to take them from on-site if possible. Mm -hmm. It's definitely, I can just take the seed and just spread the seed, right? right. But the mortality rate of that seed is going to be relatively high. Yeah. Whereas if I have an actual plant that mm -hmm. I've grown at home, and I can, I can you know, put a cage around it, I can water, I mm -hmm. know where that is. Um, there's a greater chance that that, that mm. is going to make it. And you have a little prairie at your house yeah, as well. So pretty that, small. Yeah, pretty small. Yeah, and, and that one, um, I'm not, I'm, I'm transplanting seeds from here to that prairie, yeah. but I'm not going backwards. I'm not taking right. species from Iowa City and bringing them down here. That's just, I'm trying to keep this more pure if possible. But you also mentioned you are searching some places for seeds, um, and you mentioned cemeteries being a, an option. Yeah, so one of the interesting things is that um, the settlement set cemeteries, there's there's hundreds of them. Mm. And if you look at the map of all cemeteries in Iowa, like each county will just have like hundreds yeah. of these little tiny right. cemeteries all over the place. Well, and for the people not in Iowa, it's really bizarre, right? Because you'll be biking it on the road, and just in a cornfield, you'll see a little, yeah. maybe an old church or something, and then... Some... It won't even be a church sometimes. Yeah. Like, there's one, I was mentioning before, there's one about a mile and a half south of here. Mm -hmm. In the middle of a cornfield, corn, you know, completely surrounding this thing. Yeah. And it's just on private property. Right. And that idea just kind of boggles my mind sometimes, right. that these cemeteries are on private property. Yeah. But the idea is that you're going to have some prairie remnants Right. on these because yeah. you aren't killing up an old cemetery. Mm. Sometimes they're mowed, sometimes they're not. Mm. And so you're going to have a more native seed base, um, still in, you know, in theory at least, mm. in these cemeteries. Yeah. And so the idea is to go around, and there's one just north of here, um, there's a little town called Hillsboro, mm. and I went to that cemetery, and there's not a lot, but I did. there were a lot of milkweeds, just okay. a, a regular um, milkweed. Mm. And so I actually collected quite a few seed pods from that. Have you noticed many milkweed aphids on your milkweed? Yeah, the little yellow ones. And I don't know the the red ones, the ones that we have more so. Okay. I don't know if those are um, if they hurt it or not. I haven't really noticed any sort of you know. If, if, yeah. You know, if they're causing it to. So not you have red ones. That's interesting. I don't think I've seen those in the. the yeah. Aphids. So there's the the yellow aphids. There's like a red aphid, and then there's the uh, red milkweed bugs. Right. I've seen those. Yeah. yeah. So like all three. Right. Have attacked it. So. Yeah. I just have some in my garden that I transplanted. And they just got swarmed by them. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. 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 So it's curious if in like a more nat native habitat that has more predators. Presumably, right? Yeah, presumably, yep. We definitely see them out here, though. Now, uh, with regards to butterflies, um, one of the interesting things that happened this year is we came down when a lot of the swallowtail butterflies were, yeah. were around. 
and there were a ton of them. And so um, there's, I think there's about four different species that we found. There are a couple that are actually native to this area, but their mm -hmm. habitat is so degraded, like right. it's really difficult to get them back. So there's pipevine swallowtail, and then there's a zebra swallowtail. Mm -hmm. We weren't able to find any of those on the property this year, mm -hmm. um, but we're planning things like pawpaw, because the mm -hmm. zebra uh, swallowtail, their larva will actually eat the pawpaw leaves. Interesting. And so we're trying to bring some of those species back so that we yeah. can possibly get some more I don't of those. think people usually think about butterflies using trees as habitat. It's so their larval, most, most butterflies will have a different larval host than what they actually feed on. Right. And so the larva of um, swallowtails, they'll feed on different things like the, the prickly ash, I think that I showed you last time. With the real spiky. The spiky yeah. and it had the, the, the fruit that was a citrus fruit. I'm not sure I'll if I'll show, I'll show you some of those. In the, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the prickly ash is a great species for many of the different swallowtails. Mm. But again, the adults don't feed on it, but the mm. larvae do. Interesting. So if you remove that, and, and like a lot of people do because it's just kind of a nuisance plant for most people right. with any kind yeah. of thorns, um, then they, again, you don't have that habitat for yeah. them anymore. Interesting. So you do, so with the seed you bring in, you try to source from local environments. And I also know you have a very strong affinity for oak trees. And when I was hiking around ledges recently, they also have a lot of nice oak trees and nice hickories. Um, and I actually collected some acorns. And I wanted to ask you, would you ever introduce native species from slightly out of range to try to diversify genetics for uh, future climate change? Or would you think that that would be a negative thing for the habitat? You would have to, the answer is yes. And I have brought um, seed in from other areas. I try to do it as little as possible, but mm. it's very difficult. If I wanted to put out, you know, 30 pounds of, of Indian grass, right. like, I wouldn't be able to collect that by myself, right? So right. you gotta buy that stuff. Mm. With something, uh, with, with regards to climate change, you'd have to mm. think like, are, is the is the climate gonna be more like it is from the north or more like from the south? And my guess is that it's probably going to be more like the climate of northern Missouri shifting up slowly. And so if I wanted to go and you know try to attempt that, I would probably want to go south and try to collect some species from down there and bring them up. Now, something like an oak, I think that you'd be pretty safe because like I'm again, just my my guess is that just the, the difference in, in you know, latitude, longitude for an oak mm. isn't going to matter nearly as much as some of the other smaller species. Mm. See, I would push back a little bit. I think if for climate change, I would take both from the north and the south, because then you don't... Just, Hedge your bet. Yeah, yeah. Yep. It, you know, because it'd probably be very variable. Right? It, absolutely, and that's the thing. That's the scary thing, really. Yeah. And so you have people that have been, you know, I've been doing this for two years, right? Mm. You have people that are working on properties, like the, the massive savannas they have over near Chicago. They've been working on them since the late 70s, right? right yeah. And so now they're going to start seeing climate change, and they're going to have 30 years, 40 years of right. work that's potentially going to be shifting pretty quickly on right. them. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's going to be much more, it's, it's going to be very interesting to see. I think trying to predict what's going to happen is a bit of a losing game, right. but you can try to prepare yourself by mm. doing things like having water on site, things mm. like that. Well, and I think what we were talking, I think, in the last conversation is that these plants are fairly well adapted, and so I think they'll survive a lot longer than if we have problems with the corn or soybeans. Or the, that's, yeah, that's something completely different. Um, the, even down here with the, the relatively minor drought that we had, um, and it was, it was very dry, yeah. but it wasn't nearly as bad as it has been in some other right, years. years ago. The corn crop down here is decimated. Like they're, okay. they're talking about basically just collecting it for silage. They're not even going to collect it for corn at oh, this point. Interesting. Just because yeah. it, the ears just didn't grow enough corn. Right. Um, soybeans are a little bit better with regards to, you know, they they can take a little bit more drier weather, but mm -hmm. they don't do nearly as well. Okay. So you have a lot yeah. of farmers down here that are going to be collecting crop insurance right. just because we had a relatively minor drought. Right. For, yeah, maybe about a month or so? Well, no, it, it's it's really been uh, three, four months where it's been pretty li conditions. limited. Yeah. Um, but it also wasn't extremely hot during that time. Right. And so we had some 90 degree days, but there, you know, often in Iowa we'll have those 100 plus degree weeks, right. we really didn't have that this year. Right. And so if you would have had that real extreme heat plus a drought, it would have been much worse. So how do you think winter conditions affect the sort of dynamics of the property? Um, well, it, you're going to get a lot of moisture through snow. Mm. And that's the thing is that going back to corn, for instance, um, with the amount of rain that we just get in the summer, you really shouldn't be able to grow that much corn in Iowa. Mm. But you get a lot, a lot of moisture loaded into the soil during the, the winter. winter. Okay. And yeah. so that sticks around, right? It yeah. doesn't go anyplace. It just it stays there, and then it will be used up in the summer. So I'm expecting, hopefully, that there's a decent amount of snow mm. this year. Um, 
it allows us to do a couple different things. We can create those burn piles. So if you if you, you can burn you know big big uh, piles of, of wood during mm -hmm. the winter very safely, mm -hmm. and so we hope to be able to do that. Um, but I think that it's you know it's it's doing what it should be doing out mm -hmm. here, and so I don't expect the winter to really impact it. Now, yeah. if there was a very extreme winter where the temperatures got down and stayed you know negative 10 negative 20 for a long time mm. that could impact some of the trees mm. especially in you know, the younger ones that we're right. trying to plant mm. but for the most part the large trees won't be impacted interesting and so this would be more of a zone 5a probably yeah or, it's yeah. zone 5 i'm not sure about the a okay i think b is colder but don't tell okay me that. yeah because um, aims is right on that the edge oh sure um, or at least historically and this is definitely you know you don't think about it being this much farther south but it definitely is and well so, if you look on the map right it's about in iowa at least it's about as far yeah. south as yeah you yeah. can go about half a county yeah. more but that's it so i wanted to talk uh given sort of the recent controversies in iowa city about zoning and we yeah. don't want to go too much into that um but i'm curious what this land is zoned as and how that's impacted your decisions you know i i don't know for sure i would almost 100 percent guess that this is 100 percent agricultural Okay. And it's just zoned ag, basically. And so, um, it, it's an interesting topic. Um, in areas like Johnson County, the, the zoning is going to be much more important because you have a lot larger population, and those yeah. individuals are going to be trying to be doing different things. Right. Down here, it's probably a little bit looser with regards to the zoning. Obviously, it's still very important to be able to, you know, not do the wrong things in the wrong zones, stuff like that. But it's probably a little bit looser with regards to, you know, how people approach the zoning. Have you made any efforts to network with the like county commissioners or people like that no that's something i want to do though i actually reached out to uh the dnr has an individual that worked with private lands mm. um i reached out to him but i think he either retired or he may have been part of the, the dnr yeah the, yeah the shuffle of can the you DNR. talk about that in case people haven't they're not from iowa haven't heard about the dnr yeah advertising? probably not the best person to talk about it but um the dnr has a lot of different divisions and so one of them was the forest and they decided to basically shuffle individuals within the forestry division, and I think most of them went into wildlife. Right. Um, which, you know, may make sense. It's, I totally understand that it's a budget thing. Um, the top person from forestry was released from the DNR, unfortunately. Um, but I think that it, it, it shows where the priorities are when you start taking things like that and mm. shuffling them around. Forestry in Iowa is right. not something that most people think of. They think of ag in Iowa, they think right. of corn, they think of soybeans, they think of cattle, they think of pigs. Right. They don't think of forestry. Mm. But it's critical, right, to right. this state. It's very critical for mm. the state to have, and even if you want to think about things like ecotourism, mm. um, it's very important for us to be, be yeah. you know, we, we have the ability to have a very strong natural environment in Iowa the priorities of the current government aren't necessarily supporting that. Right. Yeah, even as an Iowan, I think it's hard to find spaces like this or Neil Smith Wildlife Refuge or a couple of the state parks. But They're there, but the, the funding often is very limited. Mm. Uh, there are some amazing ones that, like you said, Neil Smith, mm. they have phenomenal property. They take a lot of good care of mm. it. They have the bison. Um, but they're, they're, I'm sure they're underfunded. Mm. So... Uh, going forward, if you ever wanted to put a house on here, I don't know if you've Natalie talked about having a small. Yeah, it would be more like a, a cabin more than anything, um, and I'd have to look into what the rules yeah. are with regards to that. I think if we wanted to put, it, I don't, I don't necessarily want to make this um, up my backyard, mm. and so I'd rather have something where I could come down and you know work, and then like stay overnight, something like that, okay. more so. Yeah. Um, I don't want to try to urbanize this too much. Okay. And I, so yeah, I think that we'd probably go that route. And so, in say, you know, like 150 years when our robot bodies wear out, you know, <laughs> have you thought about kind of how you want to try to preserve this and keep it going in the future? That's the scary thing, right? Because um, the idea is that you want to take this land, which has been obviously here for a long time, right. and um, you, you want to make it so that when you're gone or when you, like, mm. I'm not going to be able to do this forever, right. Right? even I'm going to get old enough where I would love to be able to do it, but I can't. Um, you want to try to set up a legacy mm. so that somehow it's going to be Right. And there are great agencies that you can work with. Um, mm. You can put it in different land trusts and things like that. Um, the Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation is a great example, and there's some amazing properties that are being currently managed mm -hmm. that when those individuals decide that they're done with them, mm -hmm. they basically will you know, provide access to the mm -hmm. INHF. 
And that's a great way to go. Now, it does take away some of your, your personal ownership of it. Right. But I'm not so excited about the, the personal ownership as I am about um, trying to restore this. Right. Okay, so we're back. We had a, a battery problem. But it's <laughs> fortunately, Grant, uh, good job, has a spare battery in the bag. So props to him. Um, yeah, so we're talking like legacy and trying to preserve it into the future and... Yeah, I don't want this to be a, a 30 year project. I want this to be a forever project. And mm. It's very difficult to try to set that right. up. Mm. And some people, um, they try to work with individuals that are, are a younger generation. Same minded. So, yeah, people. exactly. Yeah. So that, you know, they, they kind of um, inherit the working on the land, basically. Mm. I don't know what that's going to be like in the future, right? right. I, I'm not sure if, if more or fewer individuals of the next generation are going mm. to be interested in, in doing this type of stuff. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's very laborious. It's, it's very very difficult work and I, I, like, I personally this is my this is my relaxation right um, I yeah. come down here to you know get back in, in touch with nature I guess yeah. and I don't I, I love the, the physical aspect of it um, but not everyone's like that right and how often are you able to make it down here uh, about once a week and so yeah. I, I try to come down um, Which is on a weekend about an hour and a half drive each way right it is it's, yeah. so it's three hours round trip just a little bit less than that and then by the time you know you're you're getting the equipment ready and cleaning right. equipment and all that it takes a bit of time um, but it's close enough like what I didn't want to do is try to find a property that was you know six hours away on a right. lake and a cabin yeah. and stuff like that because it's now it's a commitment you're only going to be able to go there every once in a while. Right. With this, at least, I'm able to come down and visit pretty frequently. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to come down and go back on the same day, which right. is important to me. Yeah. I am concerned about, you know, the, the gas that I'm using, mm -hmm. and that is a, that's a, a major concern that I have. But at the same time, um, it's a big carbon sink, and so I should right. do calculations, yeah. right, to determine how much uh, how much of a carbon sink this actually is. Okay. Well, and just a life sink, or life, you know. It is, it is. No, sure. absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, would you ever be interested in having a property in another type ecosystem, um, or is it really the geography geography's most important thing? It's yeah, good question. Um, I would love to expand this. Uh, so instead of trying to go to different areas and try to you know have different types of, of properties, I think I'd probably want to focus on expanding this area more so. So if you had your druthers, like north, west, north or south, south, yeah, good question. Um, it's Hard. Uh, to the west of us is is basically uh, cropland. Mm -hmm. um, to the north is uh, a property that's managed um, uh, for grazing currently. And we talked previously, so they came in with a bulldozer, right, and scraped off the top X amount. Yeah, a lot of that's that's what a lot of the um, the management for some of the prairie uh, for some of the grazing areas down here is is to mm -hmm. get rid of that that weed seed, if you will, that mm -hmm. topsoil that everyone in the rest of Iowa is is yeah. craving. And then, then plant the, the grasses that are best for cattle. Mm. Um, completely different use of, of the land, even though we share a border, right? Right. And so the difficult thing is that a lot of that topsoil takes thousands of years to right. be restored. Right. So it'd be very difficult to go into one of those areas. Now, that was done over here as well. And so that's why we're not yeah. going to see the same amount of, like, quality species mm. as we are on the very eastern edge. Right, where we shot the interview last time. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And so there's a completely different range of species over mm. here yeah. than over here. Interesting. Okay, so, you, but if you were going to north or west or? Uh, uh, probably south. Um, it's, it's very thick timber, mm. but you can tell from the, the satellite photography that there are some massive oaks in there. Mm. And so what you'd be able to do, just as I mentioned before, is you can go into an area and start daylighting those oaks, mm -hmm. basically clearing out everything around it so they can start getting a lot more sunlight in there. And then over the course of decades, right. um, you can you can restore it to more savanna-ish. So I noticed that you have a couple oak trees out in more of the prairie area with flags on them. Yes. Um, are you trying to sort of protect certain like small ones to get a diversity of ages on the property absolutely yeah that's the big thing so anytime I find an oak mm -hmm. if it is either a, um, a white oak or a bur oak especially mm -hmm. I'll flag it and then I'll often try to mow around it and what I'm doing down here today is actually mowing around all of the oaks either large or small mm -hmm. so that when we do burn um, we're not getting fire actually on the oaks the, mm -hmm. uh, the larger ones it won't hurt but I don't want something to catch on fire high right. up in the tree, for instance. Mm. The smaller ones, they will be set back. And so they'll live, 
because they have that massive underground structure, but I don't want to continually be starting from zero with right. these oaks. And so what I'm trying to do is mark them, tag them either with tape or with flags, hmm. and then mow around them so that if a fire hits them, it's a very small fire. Right, and it looks like they have multiple trunks, so they've probably been knocked down before. Most of them have probably been cut down 10, 20, 30 times. You think so? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So um, the root base on them could be quite enormous. The root base could be 20 years old on some of these trees. Yeah. We have one over there that was probably about six inches-ish when we first um, started working on the property, and it's around six feet tall now. Wow. And so that's yeah. only in like a year and a half. Right, right. And so I was really surprised by the growth on some of these, and they have these massive, massive leaves on them because they're just trying to you know, capture whatever they yeah. can when they're younger. Yeah. Interesting. And so this is the, wait, is this the first or second full summer you've had here? This is the second full summer. Okay. And so, yeah, we've had the property now for about a year and a half at this point. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm interested in seeing the future. Um, just continue the more the same, introduce more species, continue to... Yeah. Document species is a big thing. And so if we find anything new, it's extremely important. Um, introduce new species. There aren't a lot of native grasses in this portion just because the, the native grasses don't do well in a grazing environment. Mm. The, the foreign grasses, they can be really chewed down to right. the very top. So that's kind of like what... These are, are all, the, yeah, the these are all more foreign grasses, okay. uh, non-natives. Um, so what I want to do is, the, the next step, if you will, is going to be to burn this whole area from the, the second creek all the way over to the road. Oh, so you're going to reburn this side? Reburn, yeah. Okay. Everything yeah. can pretty much be reburned on a, an annual basis when you're first starting out. Yeah. Um, so reburn this and then actually seed this with a couple different native grass species. Okay. And those are, you know, those are a lot cheaper than the forbs. I put some forbs in on the other side. Um, may have been a little bit too early with that, but just trying to trying to get some stuff, new stuff in there. Hmm. So, jumping back one step, you said documenting, and I know from being your Facebook friend that you do post a lot of your images online, uh, which I really appreciate because I always see cool stuff. Yeah. Um, but how do you, tell me a little bit about how you think about you know social media and trying to expand other people's knowledge, um, or how you see what you do on Facebook? Yeah, I I guess this stuff is accessible, more accessible to people than they think it is, right? Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, in Iowa City, you mentioned Hickory Hill Park. Yeah. Um, it's, it's definitely well used, but most people, when they walk through it, they don't necessarily see the same things as right. individuals that have taken the time to really investigate it have. Right. And I was introduced to a term that was, it, it took me a second to understand it, and then I was like, it's brilliant. And people, they call it tree blindness. Yeah. And the idea exactly is that about. people yeah. will go through an area and they may, there may be 50 different types of trees, right. but they don't understand what any of the species are right. and they don't know how to distinguish between one species versus the other. Right. And so I think that most people have nature blindness. Yeah. They go through and they understand like this is probably more natural, but they may see this as just well, weeds, yeah, for instance. Or like Nice on me, but like one seed head versus a different seed head versus a third seed head. Exactly. You know, which look totally different once you like actually analyze them. But, but from if, 10 feet away, from 15 yeah. feet away, where most people are experiencing it, right. they don't necessarily see the difference in plants. Yes. They don't see the difference in trees. Um, and so that's, you know, I would love for people to be able to, and most of the photography that I do is more close up, right? Like a more macro level photography. Right. And that's just to, one, I love that, just seeing the detail of it. Mm. And two, to encourage people to think, like, if you get a little bit closer to these things, mm. you're going to start seeing that it's not just, like, a go one goldenrod. Right. It's a goldenrod that might have ten different types of pollinators on right. it at one point in time. And a gall. And, and a gall yeah. and, like, all sorts of stuff. And there's yeah. this great, I don't know who said it, but there's this great, qu great quote that talks about how, you know, you could take one square foot of land. Yeah. And you, your lifetime could be dedicated to learning everything mm. there is to know about what's going on in that one square foot of land. Right, right. And so, like, think about all the stuff that you could learn from a property like this. It's yeah. just, it's, it's mind-boggling. And so, it's, it's definitely a huge responsibility to try to encourage other individuals to, to, to get that. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important um, for people to somewhat slow down. I, I, I love the photography element of it. One of the things that is a little bit frustrating is you see people and they're constantly like on a phone outside doing things. It's that's a little bit frustrating to me. Right. One great thing is that there is not much of a cell signal down here, right? right? right. So you yeah. really don't have the ability to yeah. do that. But capturing stuff, um, that's one of the main ways that I capture things to, to go back 
and mm. later it's a, to identify mm -hmm. is through photography. And, you, you can't know all the places. And you add a little bit more than just the identification. You add like a little bit of backstory, you know, like this type of bee or this type Make of... Make it interesting, yeah. right? And so, yeah, you yeah. try to throw in a little plug for like why this insect is yeah. just a little bit different or how mm. most people think, for instance, that the solidago species, most people think that those cause massive allergies right. when in fact that's ragweed. It's a completely right. different species. Right. And if you take a look at two of them side by side, you'll right. see like, yeah, they are absolutely, there's no similarities between right. the two of them. Yeah. But again, so plant blindness. Tall green stem with yellow flower. Yellow flower. Yep. Yep. flower. Yep. That's interesting. Is this one of those things I really appreciate seeing uh, online. Is there any area in that you'd like to expand further? Like, well, there are some great blogs out there, right? And so um, there are people that have properties that have that do these fantastic blogs, and I just haven't taken the time to really put you know put that much effort into it. Yeah. I would like to. I think it's something that I could um, definitely pick up and try to you know catalog the past experiences right. and then do more yeah. with. Um, I mentioned before that I'm, I'm getting back more into GIS, and so there's a lot of really amazing things we can do with the development of maps mm -hmm. and trying to you know pinpoint different yeah. species to determine if like soil type, like we mentioned before, right. you can take your soil maps and, yeah. and is there a reason that the tall green milkweed is only on that property? It might right. be because of the soil, right? Yeah. So are there areas that on the soil map that that same soil is over here? Yeah. That might be where how I'm going to propagate that. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff like that. I think that most people would find some element of it mm -hmm. interesting. It may be food. It may be right. food production. I mean, there are great th opportunities out here. Like I was mentioning, uh, walnuts and hickory yeah, nuts. Yeah, some walnuts down the creek. Pawpaw yeah. trees, um, like all the different stuff, blackberries. Yeah. So there's a lot of native food. Can, can we, can we talk, go back to pawpaw for a minute? Yeah. I mean, that's one of the th first things we talked about on the property. Um, and I don't think a lot of people know that there is a small level of amylotoxin that causes, is correlated with atypical Parkinson's with the cherimoids and the soursops and pawpaws being the North American version. Um, talk to me about your opinions on this type of thing. Like, so I think you would have to have a, I guess, chronic exposure yeah. to to that type of low level right. um, of uh, whatever chemical to for it to actually be a problem. Um, so if it was something where I was going to be, you know, having a large scale pawpaw yeah. harvesting operation, and, and that may be an issue, my guess is that it's small scale eating it every once in a while, being around it, probably not that big a deal. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's something to be uh, yeah. cautious with, I guess. And yeah. there are, you know, we're learning a lot of different things like that. Yeah. There are probably many more worse things that I'm exposed to, possibly on a daily basis. I mean, just living in a city with, with car emissions and everything else, you never know. The thing of exposure and being in the country and one of the current controversies this year, specifically with the massive monoculture, agriculture, uh, have you had any problems with 4DT? Uh, no, there are, so one of the big issues down here that I, I personally feel isn't great is aerial spraying. Mm. And so I know that that's like one of the issues is um, overspray or spraying the wrong areas or whatever it might be. It hasn't been an issue that I know of down here, um, but I, I know it, it might be. Right, well unfortunately you have a cattle farm so they don't really spray much and the woods should protect you somewhat. In theory, but there's... You know, the the drift would be pretty extreme. There's right. there's cropland pretty much surrounding it. Right. There's yeah. a bit of a buffer with you know just uh, the immediate area. Right. But once stuff like that gets in the air, it right. may go for quite a while. So like water quality wise, there's a stream down here. There's a stream over there. There's little ponds, right? But um, have you done anything to? I mean, your property's all naturally vegetated, so there shouldn't yeah. be much runoff or anything. But have you thought about water quality in this property and I would large um iowa at large yes i think that um again i was an agricultural state mm. and um you know there's a lot of controversy right now on on uh with, with nitrates in water right. and i think that there are a lot of good voluntary options voluntary options right. for for farmers to mm. to you know try to improve water quality um the issue is that it's going to generally reduce the overhead, the cash flow, and so it's mm -hmm. going to be expensive to put that type of stuff in. There's a lot of programs that try to match that, and so we talked yeah. to the NRCS, DNR, right. things like that. Um, those are underfunded, obviously. Right. And so when you have these these voluntary efforts, the problem is that not everyone is on board with it. Right. And you may have 90% uh, of people on board, and then those 10% of the individuals that aren't are still creating a pretty massive problem. Right. So down here on this property. Um, I'm not necessarily concerned about like my 
what I'm doing isn't going to hurt water quality. If right. anything, this is going to be an absolute buffer mm. and, you know, to some degree, retention yeah. of, of water. Um, but it is a massive problem in right. Iowa right now. And you now. don't drink the streams? I mean, no, the no, we don't yeah. drink, it, no, not at all. Because yeah. the, the water goes through um, cropland right. and it goes through grazing land. Right. And so when you have cattle that are going up to and into the streams, right. um, you know yeah. you're going to get any any normal any number of you know fecal coliform yeah. bacteria and everything else. So we always bring our water down here. Right. Now, if we were to uh, have some sort of cabin, it'd be great to have some sort of water source, so it's, uh, a shallow well. Mm. Um, shallow wells are often you know easily polluted, so mm. it'd be more of a concern at that point. So you also mentioned um, like food. Some people's interest in land being food production. Um, and have you thought done anything specifically in that direction for this property? I know it's mostly a habitat restoration, um, but are there certain directions you're going for in that direction? Not really. Um, there isn't any. We we don't do anything to harvest food from this property. Like on even any foraging. Scale. Yeah. Uh, if there are blackberries, I'll pick blackberries. Right. You know, black raspberries, things like that. I haven't done anything with hickory nuts, with walnuts, anything like that. Um, there are a massive number of them, right. and so in theory I could, right? right? But it's not a big priority of mine. Yeah. Um, I don't have any plans to put in any sort of plots. Mm. You would have to have some pretty decent fencing, or have you know uh, crops that deer aren't necessarily going to be interested in. But I think that for the most part, we're not going to focus on the, the food production by any means. Mm -hmm. So are you against foraging on the property or just not a thing that you allocate your time towards? It, it's, I'm not against foraging by any means. I just don't allocate my time towards it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be fantastic for individuals if they, if they wanted certain things. What I'm not into is introducing non-native species into this property for the purpose of development of food. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just don't have the, 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 the need for it, I guess, mm -hmm. on my own personal level. Um, some people I know are, are super into it, mm -hmm. and I think that that's fantastic, and it's another way that people can you know, get back in touch with nature on their mm -hmm. own. Mine is more about restoration of the native plants, yeah. and if any of those are edible, hey, I'm down, right? right. I'll eat that, yeah. but it's not specifically to create a place for food. How's your mushroom, like thinking of foraging and different species and also just identifying species, and we both know Grant, yep. um, how is your mushroom identification? Weak? Um, yeah, 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 nothing that I would, I would be proud of by any means. Um, I, this this property, I haven't found a lot of different types of mushrooms. Although it's been fairly dry. It has been very dry, and so during a wetter year, more likely. Uh, there are some, I have not I have not taken any mushrooms to eat from this property. And I haven't really seen on Facebook many pictures of mushrooms. No, not at all. And there, there are, I have found a couple, um, like there was one morel last year. I didn't find any this year, but like you said, dry. Um, there are a couple of the different puffball varieties. Uh, there was a, uh, I think it was called a black staining polypore that I showed a picture to Grant. Mm. He identified for me, um, but nothing that I've. Yeah. I, I, I guess I, I want to be a bit, a bit better with my identification skills yeah. before I start harvesting. So. Yeah. And are you um, comfortable talking about trail cams that you put on the property? Yeah, uh, it's one of those things where I, um, you know, we're interested in what the wildlife mm -hmm. is out here. We, we don't hunt. We don't allow hunting. I guess it's more of a refuge for animals than it is for anything else. Uh, we have seen a, a variety of different wildlife out here. Um, nothing too exotic, nothing too unique at this point in time. Are you reticent to talk because you're worried about people trying to track down for hunting purposes? Uh, to some degree, um, yeah, yeah, a little bit. And, and it's one of those things where, you know, people poach on, on land pretty mm -hmm. frequently. And so we definitely don't um, you know, publicize where we put the trail cams. Right. Um, I try try to hide them um, for you know in case someone wanted to mess with them, and they're locked and everything. But at the same mm. time, you know you could you could definitely do harm to them. Yeah, it's one of those things where I, I hope that people respect the the boundaries that we've right. set up. If individuals wanted to be on this land to enjoy it for what it is and to you know investigate and to look at plants, I have no problem with that. Um, when when they cross the line in terms of they, they come to to kill things, right? That's when or even I to have disrespect an issue. and litter or to disrespect or, or whatever you, it might be. Have you had any problems with that, that you know of? Uh, we did see tire tracks, uh, mm. so someone drove through a portion on the far side. Mm. Um, but since then, fencing has been put up so mm. that it's not possible for people to really get back okay. in there at this point. Conveniently, at least. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And so, um, you know, there, there could be any number of reasons for people mm. to possibly be back there, but um, they. 
they chose to drive on it. So it didn't hurt anything necessarily. Right. But at the same time, it's trespassing. So. Right. And do you know your neighbors pretty well? Uh, to, yeah, to the north, yes. To the west, it's actually family. Um, to the yeah. south and east, no. And I've heard that the individuals aren't, they don't live around here. Okay. And so they're, they're, you know, they own the land, but they don't live close by. Hmm. So I'm not sure what the story is. A lot of the land down here is purchased in very large quantities. Right. And then individuals, it might just be a, a, a lot that was thrown in with a bunch of farm ground that someone bought 30 years ago. Interesting. And they yeah. may or may not use it for anything. Yeah. Which would make it hard probably to track down if you did want to expand eventually. Yeah. It's, it, you know, and it's not something that I'm, I'm able to do right now, but it, it's you can find people. There's, you know, obviously the, the county records and everything. You know, it's my people who own land. Mm. So, um, obviously, you're doing this with your partner, Natalie. Yep. Um, do you guys differ at all in vision for the property, and how do you sort of reconcile that? Uh, I think we, we both enjoy it. We both enjoy being down here. Um, we both enjoy the work, the, the getting back into the nature component of it. I think the, the difference is is I, I probably prioritize my time a little bit more mm. with this. Um, I'm able to come down a little bit more often than Natalie is. And I, I, it's, I'm not, you know, neither of us are right or wrong in that. It's just that it's a matter of priorities. Um, I think that my style is to try to front load it in terms of to do more the first couple of years. Um, and I think Natalie is probably more on the, the slow and steady aspect of it. Uh, but we also have, you know, a lot of other things going on in our lives. We both have jobs, we're, you know, working at our house. Right. You know, she's volunteering at the animal shelter. And so there's all these other competing things that we're yeah. doing. For me, I, I try to prioritize this because it also is my place to kind of reset. Right. And it's almost like my, my meditation, if you will, is to be out here on the land. How would you guys approach, like, if you had feral cats, uh, domesticated house cats that were in the property? On the property. Because I know you guys are, you know, you have cats. You yeah, we do. Like we them. do. Uh, it's not something yeah. that I would actively want to, you know, hunt and kill them by any means. I think down here there are enough natural native predators. The coyotes and... Exactly. So I don't think that there are too many non-native species actually on the property. Um, there may be... I mean, pheasants are... I don't. I haven't seen pheasant out here. Pheasants aren't native. But again, they're relatively controlled in, in Iowa and they're hunted pretty frequently. Um, there aren't... I don't think that there's any non-native snake species that would be out here there's like one or two butterfly species not a major concern right, at right. this point yeah. um so yeah there really aren't that many non-native animal species mm -hmm. now there are armadillo for instance coming up from the south have you we haven't seen any on this yet. property but there are there have been um roadkill armadillo in iowa interesting and I'm, so yeah. that's one of those species where you know they like sandy soil so mm -hmm. in theory we could have yeah. someday armadillo yeah. and then we'd have to decide it's kind of cool to have yeah. that type of species, but they also might disturb other native animals, yeah. and so you'd have to decide, you know, which way you want to go with that. Right. Because would there to be native to the continent, but for various reasons. There's a whole hell of a lot of stuff yeah. that's native to the continent yeah. that isn't native. Because when you're yeah. talking, you know, southern Mexico to, sure, to sure. northern yeah. Canada, yeah. that's a pretty big span. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it, we. I like to think about it more in terms of, you know, the. the It's, it's interesting. There's always a, a lot of folders to open up with development and climate change. And, and where, do you, where do you draw those lines, right? Because, like, it's a good example. If you say, like, well, uh, native to within 20 miles of this property, right. native to within 100 miles, right. 10,000 miles. Like, where, does you, where do you actually draw right. those lines? Yeah. And so it's, it's kind of arbitrary to say, like, well, I'm going to draw it in terms of, like, anything that's native to Iowa. Well, what about northern Missouri? Like, right. I, like we talked about, it's True. more common with northern Missouri than it yeah. is with... So if you think about, well, if it's common to all of Missouri, mm -hmm. it probably doesn't belong here because southern Missouri is a completely different right. habitat. Do you keep hard and fast rules or is it more like a guiding principle that it should be as close as possible? More more principles than mm -hmm. anything. I don't have any, like I wouldn't take non-native species and introduce them to this ground. Non-native meaning like native historically to Iowa, Missouri, the Midwest. Okay, so if you, for whatever, let's, let's uh, imagine a larger ecological zone, sort of like the Pleistocene Park we were talking about in Russia, yeah. but in the Midwest setting, um, would you try to reintroduce historically similar species, for example, mountain tapirs or uh, 
you know, if you could get a woolly rhinoceros or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Would you try to introduce things that were before the, the, Pleistocene, like the Pleistocene era animals? Yeah. Okay, Pleistocene animals? Yeah, good question. Um, huge hypothetical. Yeah. I think that, well, one, you would need a massive, massive um, property in right. order to do sure, that properly. Sure. And so if I had that... Like a thousand um, acres. It, it, or or 10,000 acres, okay. honestly, to do something of that scale. If I had that, I think it would be interesting to try to do that. Mm. You, I go back to what was the reason that those species are no longer present. Um, there are certain species that are no longer present on this property because of human interaction. Like buffalo. Like buffalo. And so if, if you were to, in elk, yeah. exactly, and, and, and species of plants that are no longer here because of the removal of fire. Mm -hmm. So would I like to be able to restore that to kind of, you know, not necessarily erase history, but to be able to take what used to be here mm -hmm. and through a hell of a lot of work and, and really, you know, putting time back into it to restore that, including the, the megafauna, mm -hmm. It'd be fantastic, right? Um, it's it's very difficult. It would be that's when you need massive, massive funding for the purchasing of the land, for the, right. the you know restoration of the land. Um, even things just like fencing right. would be extraordinarily yeah. expensive. So I don't think that that's going to be something that's possible for the individual landowner to do. Um, what I can do is make uh, an island, if you will, right. in the agricultural land that is this county. Right. And, but I wouldn't be able to go on a, 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 a landscape scale and do right. any sort of restoration project. Yeah, so, it could just as easily become degraded if you had too much. I mean, obviously this buffalo, I don't know if buffalo could be supported on 40 acres. Not 40 acres. acres. Well, you could have a, a bison, I suppose, right. but it would be very difficult. Um, and you couldn't really rotationally graze it very easily. No, no. You, 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 would need, you would need much more area. But you would be able to, like, again, like, I'm not going for the megafauna, and so I focus more on the things I can can work with. Butterflies, that's yeah. a big one. You know, um, other pollinators like bees, mm -hmm. another good one. Um, things like bobcats, yeah. I would mm -hmm. love to have. And snake species, there's yeah. there's great uh, snake species in Iowa that not a lot of people ever see. Right. So that's when you take, you know, we were mentioning the tree blindness and everything else before. I, I have snake blindness. Like, I right. can take a look at a snake and yeah. kind of, like, get a key out and go down yeah. to it. There are people that will look at a snake and basically can tell just at, like, one glance. Right. That's yeah. a whatever it is. Yeah. And so I think that there's a lot for me to learn out here. Um, so the snake species, uh, number of insect species, bees. I'm mm -hmm. not that great with bees. But also this gives me that kind of that playground, that sandbox, to be able to expand my capabilities. Right. Have you ever, would you consider putting out like rock piles for yeah, reptiles? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I would love to be able to do things like that. Over that way, we actually put in a big brush pile. Okay. And so just yeah. like, again, yeah. more habitat right. that's like that would be here naturally, yeah. sure. but is not now. And so, so trying how, to remove the, How much would you say you burn and or how much would you say you leave those brush piles? Oh, uh, well, we put the brush piles in the areas that are more wooded. Mm. Uh, we don't put brush piles out in the middle of the prairie just because they will burn. Okay. And so what I don't want to do is, you know, create a habitat for, or a, a home for some sort of species. Right. And then just burn it when yeah. they're in there, possibly. Right. So that's an issue. Um, so yeah, we try to keep those in areas that we're not necessarily yeah. going to burn aggressively. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. Because you've talked, and you have a, a burning company. I don't know if we talked about this in the last... Uh, interview at all. Yeah, we've done a, a lot of um, transition ecology. It's an organization that I started with Liz Moss, uh, a friend and uh, a person who's very passionate about the same yeah. stuff uh, in Iowa City. Mm -hmm. And we've done a lot of um, burning, prescribed fire for... Prescribed private, burning. Yeah. Prescri yeah, prescribed <laughs> fire. Uh, for private individuals, for organizations like the Nature Conservancy, for city governments, mm -hmm. for companies that have properties that um, have prairie on. So there's a lot of people who have pretty decent chunks of ground, mm -hmm. but they don't have the time or the interest or, you know, for whatever reason, they don't have the ability to manage it themselves. Mm -hmm. And so that's, we've been able to, you know, work with them. To and are you still, is when we last talked, you were sort of on the fence that you were going to continue, uh, are you still yeah, doing it? Or? We, we are to a small degree. Mm -hmm. um, you know, both of us have, uh, full-time jobs and so it's, it's a pretty minor part of our professional mm -hmm. lives if you will but 
Um, it, you know, this has given me the ability to kind of do that. Right. Uh, before, that was my only uh, my right. only way to really get back into yeah. nature was to do it through yeah. that. Now I have my own photography to work on. And fortunately, you can use the equipment. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And how much, um, just like ballparking, how much capital did you have to put in to establish just to getting the basics of like the water truck and the flappers and the masks and the... For strap fire? Yeah. Depends on like what you want to get into. Um, the most expensive things are definitely going to be any sort of like um, vehicles. Right. Uh, so, for instance, having an ATV or having a, a utility vehicle of some sort, like a Polaris or a, a Kawasaki. Red. We have a yeah, yeah, we have a Kawasaki Mule. Um, those are get expensive quickly, mm. and so those might be you know ten, twelve thousand dollars okay, for like a vehicle. A so it's like car. it's like a car. Yeah. yeah. So it's a big commitment. Um, and then if you're going to get any sort of pump with a water source, those can go anywhere from our first one, like I, I bought a pump and I kind of put it together into a handmade thing mm-hmm. uh, or homemade thing and it was, you know, probably cost about maybe a thousand dollars to put everything together. Um, the hand tools are not that expensive. Mm-hmm. You can buy those through any number of, of catalogs, mm-hmm. um, but you need but things like drip torches to, to mm-hmm. control the fire. Those might be $100 each. Flappers might be $30 each. Rakes. So it's a relatively low cost to actually do the actual right. fires themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're doing them professionally, right. you need to have insurance. Right. You need to have people that have been trained. You need So mm-hmm. it gets it ramps up the cost yeah. pretty dramatically. Do you have insurance for when you do it on this property? Or? We have we have property insurance on okay. this property. And so it, it, you know, if there were something that were to burn up, whatever it might be, that would be taken care of. Even if you intentionally put the fire for like a security break? Uh, yes, but at the same time, like you had... You, if I were to just come out here in the middle of the summer and light a match, no. Okay. And so you have to have intent in like you know a plan and be taking right. all the right precautions mm-hmm. to be able to do things uh, in an appropriate manner. Do you think the insurance adjusters would factor in your experience with the company, or like I could put a layperson and give them the right preparation? It's very difficult to get any sort of insurance that covers prescribed fire doing mm-hmm. professionally. Okay. Um, on your own property, it's a different situation. Mm-hmm. It falls under a different category. But for people that are trying to do it professionally, mm. most organizations won't insure you. And if those, if you do get insured, it's usually very expensive. Mm. And the first time you have an issue, you're often released. Okay. So it's it's yeah. difficult to get. It's difficult to maintain. If you have any problems. Right. So obviously, you know, first goal is no not having problems. But anytime right. you put that that fire to the ground, um, you have the potential for having yeah. those issues. So you have to be very careful with that it. Makes sense. And I remember you had humidity charts and you had a plan of attack and you, you prepared the land with like mowing and uh, yeah. There's a lot of work that goes into it, and it's you, you try to remove as many um, potential problems, mm-hmm. or potential you know areas that are going to be problems as possible. But wind shifts, uh, right. humidity drops. Mm-hmm. Um, people have heart attacks on fires, right. and so you have all these issues that could pop up at any point in time. And so you try to mitigate as many of those risks as possible, and then um, it's still a decision, am I going to do this or am I going right. to not do it? So, but up to this point, your company is still active, and you're still paying for insurance and whatnot. Yep, yep. Okay. up until this point we are. Yeah. So that's got to be something of a impetus to keep going, right? Because you're already paying for insurance, so you have to have at least a few burn jobs per year to kind of yeah, that cost. yeah. When we we do a number of um, of projects, and so it's yeah, you wanna you wanna make money. You don't wanna lose money by any means. Um, it's also it's one of those things where if either of us were trying to make it a larger percentage of our life, or a larger percentage of our professional life, um, we would probably put more into it. But a lot going on. Yeah, interesting. So. Is there anything else on the property you kind of you're looking forward to for the coming season? Yeah, you know, I think it'll be interesting to see. Um, new species are always exciting, mm-hmm. and so trying to find getting out enough to, to be out here when the new species pop up that's mm-hmm. a really important thing. I think um, looking at the the wildlife is going to be something that's interesting mm-hmm. over the, the span. Um, being able to see the response to the burning, the response to the mowing. I think that's going to be great. We've seen some of it already with regards to oaks having more leaves and, and more acorns this year. Even after one year, mm. they've been able to you know do a little bit better. Yeah. And so I think just seeing the the property respond to the actual management, mm. it's a very it's a very slow response. 
but it's it's you see yeah. it when you're out here enough you do see it did you notice any differences in the prairie itself between the burned part and the non-burned part Is well it's just yeah. ease of ease of access you definitely so when you walk through this mm -hmm. um it's it's not as brushy, right. just simply because you removed a lot of years of just built up growth. Good stems and exactly, and so over there, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, the, with the multiflora rose, so like mm -hmm. one of the invasive species, right. it, there's a lot, a lot less multiflora rose over okay. here, yeah. and so it's much easier to go in and cut multiflora rose that has come up and just has one year's growth as opposed to ten years growth on one yeah. side. And so you do use some herbicide, um, but like apple applied to the location. We do, and not on the area that has the the best of the like the the more savanna side of it. We don't mm -hmm. use herbicide over there. Even if you found like multiflora rose, or just not. We just cut it. We okay. just cut it and let it, and so if you cut moss floral rose enough, um, it will it die, but you mm. have to do it quite a bit. Mm. Uh, we're hoping that the fire helps with that, but it's mm. a, a lot longer process. Right. Herbicide on this side, generally what we're doing is, if it's something like autumn olive or Russian olive, something that just will not die unless you use herbicide, mm -hmm. we will use it over here, um, just because it's a it's a multiplier, right? You, mm. you can't... You can't expect to hit all of those stems multiple times in the year, right. and so the herbicide yeah. just helps you out a little bit. Mm -hmm. But as limited as possible, it's like a dab applicator. By no means are we spraying anything. Um, so yeah, it's it's one of those. It, some people go through, you know, whole restorations and don't use any type of herbicide. I applaud that. Um, I think it's a very difficult thing to, to get away from. Right. So it's just using a tool. It's a tool in your right. toolkit. Are there any other sort of like? A applicable technology tools that you would like to introduce to the property that you haven't done so yet? Uh, well, we do have a, a backpack torch that will help remove, um, so it's basically like a propane tank that you attach to this wand that has fire, and it's not for like prescribed fire burning like the, the landscape style fire, mm -hmm. but it's more for spot application. Mm -hmm. The one thing that we do a little bit of is garlic mustard out mm -hmm. here. And so this is a really good tool for just killing the small young okay. garlic mustard yeah. stems. It basically melts them down. Right. Now, if you have tall garlic mustard, you would have to just sit there and, and flame right. them forever to, mm -hmm. to burn it up. And so it's really only very specific for the, the smaller ones. Mm -hmm. So we haven't used that yet. I think that'll be a good one if we have enough garlic mustard to use for it. Um, but yeah, there isn't anything else that, I mean, fire is the big thing. I always want to get as much fire on the property as possible. I'm doing more mowing with the brush cutter and the brush mower. Mm -hmm. So if there are small trees that are in the prairie that aren't oaks, mm -hmm. I'll go and try to cut those out. But yeah, mm -hmm. nothing yeah. else at this point in time. Cool. Okay, any final thoughts for the interview today? Or no. Just go walk around? Yeah, I think speak? walk around. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, like I did last time, I encourage people to get out there. there. I'm sure there's something within you know 20 miles of you that would allow you to get out and really investigate this stuff. So, And there's definitely people as well. So there are people that are interested in this thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of different volunteer organizations. Um, so yeah, you don't have to own the land to be able to work on it, but it's, uh, it's, it's pretty fun. So. Okay, well, we'll All talk right. around. All right, thank you. <laughs>